you're pretty excited about us, you know, adding um, the spatial capabilities to um, to Cockroach DB as we did last last fall. In fact, I will tell you, um, it was the most requested feature uh, for really quite some time. And so I think it's you know it was a, it was a, it was a lot of work by our team to to get that incorporated. But we'll come back to kind of what's in there and what it is. But just so we can level set, I mean, we're going to talk about spatial data here. Mike, I, how, how do you define spatial data, Michael? I just define it as um, as kind of where you know where is yeah. something, um, and that could be uh, just a point. And in this demo, it's really just points. Like where is this pub, or where am I located, or but it can also be a shape. You know, it could be the boundaries of a, a body of water or a county or a, a, a country. Uh, it could be uh, the path that a road takes, you know, so something that can be located in some space. And usually we're talking about on the surface of the earth. So, uh, which is kind of like a sphere, but not really. We It's kind of a flattened sphere. So we call it a spheroid. So there's all kinds of nuance to this sort of thing right and so why are there separate libraries for spatial data versus you know i'm just going to use some floats and you know kind of sort it out myself what what is it what is, you know when we started to add these capabilities to cockroach right we looked at post gis what's in that what is what's in that package and kind of what did we add in cockroach i mean so in cockroach db we basically um, tried to be as, you know, we typically try to be compatible with Postgres, right? And so we continue in that same vein and PostGIS is the spatial library for uh, Postgres. And so we just started from the ground up and said, you know, we, we need to add these things that are points, uh, lines, line strings, polygons, you know, all these different types of objects. But then we also had to add operators, like how do I create a point or how do I can take from a point, how do I get its latitude and its longitude so I can, you know, maybe I need to work with those discrete components. How do I find objects that are within some distance of other objects or how do I tell if these two shapes are overlapping right. or if this shape is contained within this other shape completely? You know, there's so many different relationships that people need to check for, you know, in their code, depending on their application. So we, okay. and then the, one of the important things is to index, you know, this data so that we can speed up these operations and to index it, like you, you mentioned cockroach being distributed, obviously we want to index it in a way that we can do in our distributed environment that we operate in. Right, so what did we have to do that was different? I mean, I, mean, I guess we had to basically rebuild what right because we built it from the ground up right michael and so what did we rebuild then to to make it you know amenable to this kind of distributed sql execution layer that we have i mean you know the, the way cockroach operates is it breaks down uh, the data into what we call ranges which are you know these chunks of data that we can push around and, and they, we can house them on different nodes and, and we can replicate them and so every bit of data that we have, including the spatial data, has to be, you know, capable of being broken down in this way. And, right. and when it comes to the index, I mean, the index was a really, it's a really important piece. And we had to choose an indexing strategy that would enable us to do that. So we did, we did find an approach that was basically decomposing the space in such a way that we can easily parallelize those indexes. Right. Yeah, so it, it's not just taking the the libraries from Postgres and porting those over. It, it was basically, I mean, we had to make it work with the underlying architecture of Cockroach. And I think it's phenomenal the work that the team did. It didn't take too long. I mean, we we got this done relatively quickly. I mean, I think I saw the first version of this, you know, last like probably a year ago or a little bit shorter than that, right? So, um, I think kudos to the team. A lot of work, right, Michael? Oh, it was it was a huge. Uh... A huge amount of work that was undertaken in a short time and then in release 20.2 is when we finally you know released it to the world and and i started playing with it i think really in earnest at that time right. and basically you know 
you, you've got these kind of function prototypes, you know, what does the function look like? What, what's the name of the function and what are the parameters? And what, when we've implemented these functions, we've made them identical to the ones that you would see in PostGIS. So that means if you were familiar with PostGIS, you would immediately be familiar with doing spatial within CockroachDB, which is, was really the goal. Right. Awesome. So I, you know, I was going to ask you kind of some of the use cases. In fact, somebody was actually already putting some use cases. Somebody was talking about, you know, where inventory lives in a warehouse. It's a good example of spatial data. But let's talk at the end a little bit more about like other use cases. I think I like your use case in your app, Michael. Honestly, I, I could have used that. I, I lived in London at one point, so I, I don't want to like, I don't, I don't want to like, you know, break your what you got going on, but let's get some hands on some keyboard. So y'all, uh, Michael has a demo that he wanted to walk through an app that he, uh, that he's built using Cockroach DB um, that, that explains some of these concepts. Again, you know, please do ask some of the, uh, any, any questions in chat, I'll try to lob them into Michael along the way. So floor is your advice. Great, can you see London, Jim there? Yes, I can. So you can see that that's a, our tourist. And you know, this was really kind of motivated by the lockdown from COVID. And the fact that I like to travel and I can't do it now, so I can do it kind of vicariously and by making an app. So th all this is, is a very simple one-page web app. Um, so it's a combination of HTML, JavaScript, some libraries, and then on the back end, a Python Flask uh, RESTful service that uh, serves up this data that we render. Uh, and then CockroachDB is obviously the, the data store that was used. Um, and really when you, the way the app works is you refresh the page and each time uh, we choose from a random collection of uh, what we'll call amenities, which could be a pub, a cafe, a restaurant, or a bar. And we position this tourist at a random choice of location from amongst uh, you know, this set of locations uh, where this enabled flag is set to true. So right now, the only place the tourist is is in Trafalgar Square. Um, and this is kind of uh, really, it's very simple. Like I said, one page of HTML. Uh, it uses uh, Leaflet. Uh, JavaScript library, it uses jQuery as well, uh, mainly to just do the uh, kind of Ajax request to go and get data. So, you know, as I said, you can kind of show these different types of amenities. And then when, uh, you know, you see show me the closest pub or whatever, when we load the page, uh, that's where that's coming from there. And you can see that these objects are being reloaded pretty, you know, really quickly. So every time I move the position of this tourist by just uh, panning the page around, you know, you can see I get a different collection uh, of amenities of pubs. And it uh, shows the name when you click it of the pub uh, and it shows the distance away from the tour. So that's what's going on. Um, and I, I could go through kind of more of this. This is really just, um, it's, there's not that much to it. You know, there's some icons. Um, we're getting the base map layer from Mapbox. Mm -hmm. And that provides, you know, this entire map view. Uh, and then we're just placing uh, objects on top of that map when we reload it. The back end, is this Python Flask application. And you can see here where, you know, this is part of our connection string. Uh, if you're familiar with Postgres, I think you'll, you'll have seen these, you know, PG database, PG user and PG password. And so these things are passed in through the environment. And here you can see that this is the first REST service that the app provides. And this is really the one that shows you or that the, the application asks uh, this, this endpoint, you know, where should I position the tourist? So the tourist is positioned at uh, any one of these, uh, these points that I showed you here. So like right now, that tourist is there. If we uh, update this, if I can get my uh, 
So now we've updated uh, that list. So now there are several other positions within London where the tourist might show up. So maybe the British Museum near the Tate Modern or near the Borough Market. For now you just, Michael, is, 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 I'm sorry, but is that logging where you've dropped this guy or is it basically your, this is, this is the default where he's going to drop in when you open Yeah, so what, what this is just some, some subset of points that I decided to put as interesting places where the tourists might kind of show up. And so if it's set to enabled is true, then that'll be a point that when you reload the page, the tourist can be, you know, can appear. All right. And then also, if you note now this time, um, we chose uh, bars. So this is the, the icon for a bar. Okay, cool. So, you know, the, the tourists can be positioned in different places and, and then you can have different types of amenities and, and a bar being one of those. So that's where, you know, that tourist location is we're just selecting the, the latitude and longitude from that table I showed you. And we're ordering it by random and just taking uh, right. one row. So uh, another thing that we're doing is um, we are, the, the main query is we're gonna try to pull, um, it, the endpoint is features. So this is the one that's gonna show you these amenities. So what, what the app is doing on, from the front end is it's passing in some JSON that contains uh, these three elements, lat, lawn, and amenity. So latitude, longitude, and you know, is it a pub, cafe, or whatever. And so what we're doing then is we're taking that as input to this spatial query. And so we're selecting uh, from the database, the name of the amenity, which when you click it, it pops up. Yep. We're selecting the distance and we're using, so we're using these spatial functions, st distance, st make point. Um, we're casting that as a geography type because that's the type we're using for all of our points. Um, reference point is, you know, the point of that amenity uh, as represented in the database. Um, this is just a cast to a numeric type to, to limit the precision, just because uh, I wanted to show that we're, we're largely, you know, we're very Postgres compatible. So you have all these functions available to you. So we get the distance in meters and then we're, um, also getting the uh, latitude and the longitude out of that point using these STY and STX functions. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting you know, this key value item, which is how we can tell if it's a uh, pub, cafe, or whatever. Right. Um, and then there's another function that we, we use is STD within. So we're just saying, Show me all, you know, we're constraining it in the query predicate to things that are within five kilometers of our reference point. And ultimately, because we're doing a limit, we're ordering it by distance ascending, and then we're just taking the top 10. That's how we get that set that we're showing here. You know, we're just taking the top 10 closest ones that are within that distance. So, so all that functionality is part of the spatial uh, development that we just, you know, released in 20.2. So in the fall, as you said. Um, yeah. So just at the, the geometry type, all that stuff, that's all part of what, what was delivered, right? Yep. So Michael, did you implement any, did you use any of the spatial functions in this at all or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, so these are all spatial functions here. Yeah. Right. Um, so we are using anything that has an ST, that's right. Um, I think ST basically stands for, for spatio-temporal um, in right. some standard that was defined at some point. Uh, so all these ST things are the spatial functions that we're using. And then geometry is one of the types, a, a spatial type, and so is geography. Right, you're just passing in. And, and, and Michael, I mean, there's a bunch of functions that come in like post-GIS, right? I mean, there's yeah, 300 or something like that isn't it's a fair amount right and I think we've implemented what 80% of them in cockroach is that is that a fair estimate something like that. I think we've implemented some, somewhere around two thirds of them so far, but yeah. I think we've yeah. chosen the ones that are the ones people tend to use most frequently. And obviously now we're asking people to, to start using this to get us some feedback of what about what they think is missing and, and what we should implement next. Right. 
Right, right, right. So. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, so this is just an example of the data that I pulled in. The data came from uh, the OpenStreetMap uh, data collection. So it's a set of you know data that's curated by you know it's kind of crowdsourced. Mm -hmm. Data looks kind of funky. Um, you know it's got uh, date time, and then here it's got uh, position. You know uh, the name of the amenity. Uh, this I only show the but uh, and then you know various other metadata about each one. so it's a really rich data set but you know we're just exploiting just a couple of pieces of it here yeah, it's going to have gone much further what's that you could have gone much further yeah 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 there, there's so much more um there and then there's also uh so this is all within just to show you if anyone's curious there is a github repository um, out here with this all this code and it's got a really detailed explanation of the spatial functions that we're using, uh, kind of the, the scope of the data set, and that's this, this chunk of the world here. Um, the DDL for the tables and some, you know, some further explanation here. Um, Michael, can you can you just take a uh, just a just copy paste that into the chat just in case people wanted to go check it out? Absolutely. Yeah. So our field org builds a bunch of different things for customers to demo lots of different things. And so we're trying to get as many of these out here as possible for everybody to use. So uh, thanks, Michael, for doing that. So Absolutely. yeah, um, so, there, I mean, we have, go on, sorry. I just wanted to mention that um, this is the DB console that comes with Cockroach DB. So it right. shows you all kinds of information about the cluster, one of which, which, which is interesting, it could be interesting if we want to talk about it is the version we're running and, and the fact that we could do an online upgrade during this demo if we want to jim it depends right. on how, how i always like seeing the online upgrade dude so like i gotta tell you so i am a uh i'm a little bit of a kubernetes freak too and i was at a company called core os and core os you know had container linux which was able to you know update like you know update linux like your phone updates you know like ios uh, which I thought was really super cool. And when I first saw um, Kubernetes, the whole concept of a rolling upgrade just was the coolest thing to me. Uh, if you want to go through a rolling upgrade, I, I would love to see it, Michael. Okay, so we just uh, started it uh, running. Um, and I'm just kind of refreshing our app just to show you yeah. that the app is available. Um, so we have a three node cluster. Currently, we only have two live nodes because we're what we're doing, the reason we call it a rolling upgrade is because we do one node at a time. And we're gonna upgrade each of the nodes to version 20.2.3, I think. Right. So um, that's happening right now. I think that you can see now that that node has been upgraded to 22.3. And all the while, you know, um, We've got a, an app that's responsive, and right. users just don't know that we're upgrading, so we don't have to take any downtime, right. which is great. And, and we can do this also with schema changes. I mean, there's a lot of things that work. I mean, this, this capability is actually pretty astonishing. Uh, and with how backwards compatible, how many different how how many versions back can we have running in a single cluster across all the nodes, Michael? Is it one or it's two, right? Or I think it's two. Yeah. yeah. Now the the thing that I unfortunately just showed you is um, that I don't have a load balance connection to our right. DB console. So uh, whereas the app is load balanced, it's all, all running through the load balancer. So it's only going to direct connections to live nodes. Right. Um, and it can direct a connection to any of the nodes in the cluster. Right. Yeah. Um, Which I think is actually a pretty important point. What Michael's talking about is Michael was connected the the DB console, the you know the 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 web app that we have to investigate what was going on in the in the in the cluster itself. You can access that from any node in Cockroach. Um, there isn't like an admin node in Cockroach. It's like any one of those three nodes would actually be able to 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 serve that up to you. Uh, and queries on the other end, you just put a load balancer in front of a bunch of nodes and it'll just distribute load and no matter where the data lives in that cluster, they'll find it, right? So, so I was just kind of trying to talk about you do your work in the background. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just had to reset my port forwarding, which is how yeah. we get access to this yep. console. And 
Um, so now if we look here, the entire cluster, all three nodes have been upgraded to 20.2.3. Without any downtime, which is- Which is what problem. we wanted to show, yeah. And then we can also, you know, uh, look at the SQL statements that are being executed, which is primarily this one that I showed you in the code, which is how we pull out those uh, nearby amenities. So well, that's, cool. that's it. And, cool. Uh, um, there were a couple questions in chat along the way. I'm going to do the spatial ones first. There was, you know, you got a couple of people asking about Kubernetes. They're asking about migration, why, MySQL, Postgres. I'll, well, I'll come back to some of those um, that were in here. I think Jim has been doing a great job answering some of these things in the background, but um, there was a question here. I'm not sure how this actually, I don't know your knowledge of this, but can you set the result set limit to be within the viewport? Sort of like search here as Google Maps may do it. I mean, I guess that could have been an upgrade to your app. This was just kind of a simple app to, to just show off the spatial, right? But you could have said like search within this constraint, correct? Um, well, that's that's kind of really what we're doing in a way. Um, right. I got the wrong piece of code up there. But we're sort of constraining it to be things that are within five kilometers. And, and I did hard code that here, but you could do it. You could parameterize that. Um, so, and that's a function that's using this STD within function that hits our spatial index. Right. Alternatively, you can also use a geo hash. Um, and I think in the GitHub repo, I talk about geo hashes and um, the, I do use those here too, because I'm kind of doing this both ways. And I select a box of like 20 kilometers on a side uh, to kind of um, constrain my search. Uh, so that's that's another thing you can do. So I, I would say, yes, you, you can do that. Yeah. So in, in this example, Michael, everything's kind of going through the SQL functions. Um, today, is there an API that we can actually access these things via you know, RESTful API or something like that? Or how would you do that with the database? I mean, I, I, mean, I guess I, you could use, yeah, go on, sorry. In, in this case, I did the easiest thing that I, that I know of to do that, and it's to take and, and, and put a Python Flask app out front. Right. And actually the app runs two instances of this app and it load balances between those as well. And those are connected to the database. So, and then these are the endpoints. And, you know, this is a post method because I'm posting JSON to it. Um, this is, you know, kind of the default route, which just renders our template, which is the HTML file. And then there was the other one here, the sites, which is just a get. And that's where you get the possible positions of the tourist. So right. I would say that the, this approach is relatively painless. Um, and there are examples. And there is the example here, which is in the GitHub repo, if anyone wanted to take it and build on something like that. Right. Yeah. I, I, we are kind of doing the original. I mean, it's basically you just use the radius of a kilometer or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, we were kind of fencing it. So, so mm -hmm. in the back end, I mean, we basically, I think the other thing that we didn't touch on when we first explained what we've actually done in building these libraries, we've actually coded all of this in Go, right? Oh, Michael? Yeah. I mean, it's not like, I think, in, you know, in, in post GIS, it's, you know, it's, 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 that's for Postgres. We've redone this though. It's, it's completely in Go, correct? Yes, well, almost all. Um, we did uh, lean on a couple of spatial libraries that we sh uh, bundle and we ship with. So Cockroach DB has one big binary, it's called Cockroach, and it provides uh, the database and also, you know, all this console functionality in one binary, you know, and it exposes two ports, one for this and one for the, the nodes to talk to one another and for your yeah. SQL clients. There are two additional library files that implement some of the functionality for spatial. So when you're installing it, if you want spatial, you need to install those libraries as well. If you don't care about spatial, then you don't need to install those. Um, right. And the other thing is, is you know, given we're, we're running in Kubernetes here, um, we have Docker images all ready to go on our, our releases page. And so you can just you can see where that is in Docker Hub and just use it from there. Yeah, somebody was asking, we actually posted that, Fabio from the team actually helped me get that link. So we posted that uh, Docker Hub, so. 
Oh, um, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And so, Michael, like, there was, I, there's several questions in there. I'm gonna I'm gonna merge some some of these questions together, y'all. Um, you know, and they were talking about you know using PostGIS and migrating to Cockroach. You know, and and you know how hard is that? I think number one. Um, let's just leave it at that. And I'm gonna come back to the benchmark side of it, and I don't think we have the great answer for that. But like, you know, how how close is this from a migration point of view? If we want to go from PostGIS libraries into Cockroach. So like I, I said, um, all in this code, all of these spatial functions are exactly the same as they would be in PostGIS. So right. that from the, the, if you were using these functions that I'm, that we support, um, you would have no trouble at all. We also provide a way to op, you know, import data efficiently into CockroachDB. Mm -hmm. You can import um, even the OpenStreetMap planet dump, you know, or chunks yes, of they, that. They do a PG dump and then import in, right? Well, we have a way. Um, I think it's OSM to PGSQL or something That's in right. the binary. And we on our website under spatial, we show you how you can do that and, and and lots of other things. But essentially, this is exactly how you would do this query in a PostGIS world. It, right. This code would run there, no problem. Yep, exactly. And it's 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 almost one to one. It just, and we like you were saying before, we have I think about sixty two thirds of coverage of all the functions, yep. and so we're we're really and it is the most popular functions, which I think is like the key thing. And I think, you know, as with any of these things, our documentation goes a very very long way. And so I, I love that you bring up our docs, Michael, because somehow magically every time I talk to somebody, I end up talking about our documentation. Uh, because it is very verbose, it, it, it's great. It, it does a really good job of explaining these things. I think, uh, you know- Well, look at this, uh, this explanation of how the indexes work. I mean, it's I, so deep and detailed. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I agree with you hundred yeah. percent. And I, you know, it's just, it, you know, for us as a company, it's one of the proud points that I have in terms of working here. I don't think I've ever worked for a company that had such good documentation. Uh, I think it's, you know, as an open source person, I, I find this stuff to be really, really important. So. You know, one of the questions here was also, um, you know, do we have a benchmark comparison between, you know, Postgres and us doing, you know, some of these, some of these uh, type of, you know, spatial applications? Uh, I, I guess we we haven't done that yet, right, Michael? No, I mean a lot. You know, we publish TPCC results all the time, uh, and uh, but we haven't done that yet. So right. that's definitely a, yeah. a to do item. And, and, and in Cockroach demo, which is a nice kind of feature of Cockroach. If you check out, if you just search out cockroach demo in our docs, um, you know, you can actually run your own benchmarks against the database. We haven't done the spatial stuff yet. I mean, it's re still relatively new to our database uh, and we're looking for people to use it and give us feedback. And if there is issues with it, we, we want to fix them as quick as possible. Um, and I think, you know, I, I speak for Andy and a lot of others. It's like, yep, we just want to see some workloads out there using this stuff to see where we can improve it. Um, there's no, I mean, there's no reason to think there's going to be some huge bottleneck or anything in this benchmark, but you know, it's, it's, you know, there's always something, right. Especially as you, as you rework, like this isn't just a port of post GIS. Again, there was a couple of questions of this. This is not simply a port of libraries into cockroach. It's a rework. It's a rewrite of all the functions. It's a rewrite of everything because of the distributed execution layer, right, Michael? And that's, what's critical here. Yeah, no, it's a good point. You, you can't just take, um, Kind of Postgres and just pop it onto some parallel infrastructure and expect it to behave right. properly. I mean, you have to fundamentally understand that this is a cloud native CockroachDB is a cloud native distributed SQL database, you know, from the ground up. And so right. everything that you do has to be done with that understanding, and that includes spatial. That's um, right. So the great thing is if you have spatial data. And you, um, oops, you want to scale out. That's the next thing we can do with Kubernetes here. Right. Um, is you can just add nodes, you know, and th this works just like anything else in CockroachDB. So I just asked uh, Kubernetes to add another pod. So soon, if you know, if we look at this, we should see this number here go up to four. Four, right? And so, you know, that that means that, okay, you, you want to take the entire OpenStreetMap data set and and run it on Cockroach. Well, we can just scale horizontally to accommodate that. 
And it was really as simple as you just did. You just added a new pod in Kubernetes and it scaled the database. Now, what it's also doing underneath covers, Michael, is redistributing that data across evenly across those four nodes, right? And so both reads and writes are now going to be serviced by four nodes and you're going to have equal of, you know, residency of data across each of those nodes, right? Which is, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and the the demo gods as usual. My course, port dude. forwarding Come setup on. is of course is bogus. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, and somebody was asking about stateful sets in here and stuff. So, so the, the for the Kubernetes people, we've done a couple different sessions on Kubernetes, and you know, thank you, Michael, for running all this on Kubernetes. I think it's kind of one of these things that's kind of to me one of the reasons I joined this company is I, I you know, if I think about a database, running a database next to Kubernetes is one thing. You know, if you want to run a single instance of MySQL or Postgres, that's it's a thing. It's just the connection string into that thing. Running something on Kubernetes is is really quite different, and not just from the scale point of view, not just scaling up and scaling down. It, it's the HA, it's the disaster recovery. It's how do you do backup and restore in that when you're doing multiple regions and all these kind of complexities of running a distributed database is the stuff that we've been working on for years. You know, when you're doing a backup and restore of a database, and you're in a you know like you know, if you have some sort of, you know, regulation on where that data lives and you're in multiple different regions and you're tying data to location, which we can do, right? Like backup and restore has to be distributed. There, there's so many complexities underneath the covers. And that's why when we add libraries, we add them and, and we build the distributed execution layer. And that, that is, it's all part and parcel. So it fits this whole, this architecture. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And obvious, and one of the other benefits you get is the parallel, you know, the ability to parallelize the backups and restores, which is pretty brilliant uh, in terms of making those faster. Yeah. Um, and whatever I did on the back end with my Kubernetes, which I am not the Kubernetes expert, I, uh, <laughs> I messed something up, I think, but nonetheless, <laughs> Our app is still running. Well, that's why you have people like Jim Hatcher around to help you do these things. And I, and by the way, why we have our community Slack channel. So Michael, no, I'm joking. Yeah, actually also, I wanted to just show you here. If now you can see that we have the extra pod and I think now I can um, get my port forwarding running again. So yeah. let me just show you what I wanted to show you earlier, which was... Murphy's law is correct, Patrick, by the way. Um, somebody's um, like Murphy's law demo. This is exactly what's going to happen. And so actually somebody else was asking, are we going to put our, um, are we going to submit our spatial functions to OGC for testing? I don't know the answer to that, but I can actually work with our product managers to, to get a better sense of that. That's a great question. But yeah. now we have four nodes. And so we have more capacity to run more queries and, and you know, house more data. So that, that actually did. Hey, it works work well, look, all right. as expected so uh and the app didn't take any downtime during yeah. during that it's, and you scale and everything was resharded and distributed across more different nodes and yes yeah, so we again have better that, disaster recovery so one of these days we'll talk about ranges and what they are and replication but maybe not today so. yeah cool um let me look through some more of these questions michael yeah, let me just, I, I'm going to pick up this one too. It was somebody was asking about, can we survive multi-region failures? Um, absolutely. It just depends on how you partition data. Um, data, when it gets written to Cockroach, is actually written three times. I just, look at what I just did, Michael. I, I put four fingers up. Actually, data, when it gets written, gets written three times. Um, and depending on how you want to, what you want to survive, a region, uh, whatever your failure domain is, it could be a node, a rack, a uh, AZ, a region, an entire country, whatever you want, you basically uh, configure each table to survive whatever, what, whatever you want it to survive. So you can actually write data across multiple different regions, three copies, one in each region, uh, in which case you can, you can survive that. Because in Cockroach, as long as we have two of three of the copies of the data, uh, we're good because we can get a quorum right at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, you can actually change replication factor as well if you want to go up to five. So it would be three of five, right? And so there's lots of different things you can do to uh, to, to survive regional failures in, in Cockroach for sure. Yeah, and, and also the, the thing is, is you would typically run your clients uh, regionally. So the, the client for the 
you know, the EU region, those clients would run within the EU and then the, um, within the same database, if you had, you know, you'd have regions in the US maybe and your US clients would run in the US. And as Jim said, you could, you, you can pin on a row by row basis your data to the appropriate region, which is right. great for minimizing latency. That's right. And, and somebody else, is, is, there, is there a master node and four worker nodes? It doesn't work like that in, in Cockroach. Every right. node is the same. Every, Every node, node is, is possible of what every other node is, is capable of doing. And that's a core kind of primitive of systems design when you're building distributed systems, right, Michael? I mean, you want, you know, like each, you know, the single, I always talk about that. What is the single atomic unit of cockroach? It's an instant cockroach. There's no special admin node and transaction node. and There's none of that. It's just the cockroach node is a cockroach. Yep. And, and here you see on our dashboard for the SQL connections metric, um, you can see that uh, we show connections for any, all of the nodes, node you know, N1 through N4. So any of them could be connected to, to apps. Uh, it looks like uh, node two is the only one right now that has a connection. But, right. Uh, so uh, Michael, how do geospatial indexes work? Uh, that's a complicated topic uh, and... Um, <laughs> Uh, I will, you know, kind of uh, the docs. do this. So basically um, how cockroaches spatial indexing works is, so typically, you know, you think of an index and um, a lot of the time you can do this kind of divide and divide the objects approach, which is like a traditional R tree index, which is how PostGIS does that. Um, you can also do this, this approach called divide the space. So you decompose the entire space you're indexing into different buckets. Cockroach takes that approach. And that, the reason is because we, we need to scale this horizontally, just like we scale cockroach. And it has a lot of other benefits. And I, I think I'd refer you to this link to really dive into that more. I, I will say that I am not the that right- might, I, Michael, that's a-, that's a half hour conversation in itself it's pretty complex right we but, do have a blog post on this too so i think if you that's right googled um cockroach db spatial indexes uh, i think samir wrote that and it's fantastic yeah. and then somebody was asking are the spatial post uh, you know these these features they are they, are they available available oh my god are they available both in the open source community version of cockroach and the enterprise version yes Yes, and in fact, I think that one of the great things about the you know Cockroach DB is it has a really viable, um, energetic, uh, open source uh, group of contributors. And as I understand it, those folks are taking on uh, adding spatial features right you know independently. I mean, and they're getting you know we're getting PRs from them, right? Uh, so. You know, where I think I said we, we had about two thirds coverage of the post GIS functionality. I, I think that's going to increase you know, fairly rapidly. Right. Um, let's see here. There, you know, there's a lot of questions about kind of core, you know, uh, cockroach stuff, you know, how we reclaim and do garbage collection across dead rows. I, that's all automated in cockroach, y'all. Um, a lot of this kind of resilience and stuff is stuff that we, we talk. There's one here though. I, I don't know if you can answer this or not, Michael. I, I'm not familiar with the answer to this, so I, I, you probably are. But um, on your roadmap, do you, what, is is it on our roadmap to implement spatial predicates in pure Go versus using GOS bindings? Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I think that right now we found um, that this library that we're using is really excellent. And so I, I think that um, we may just stick with that. Um, yeah. But the downside is it requires us to you know, ship those two additional library files, but I, I don't think it's a significant downside. If you don't need spatial, also you don't need those, those libraries. So. Right. Well, cool. I think we have answered a lot of the questions. Um, let me just come back to kind of the one of the things you and I talked about beforehand, Michael, before we kick off. like. Um, what are some of the applications people use spatial data for? Like you've been around spatial data for a while. Like what are the things, what are the workloads, the apps you've seen people? I mean, in the kind of the businesses that I've worked in, it's, it's really um, part of it's kind of wanting to know uh, what went on 
or what is going on, where and by whom, and you know who's involved, how far away is it, or if you know I have a path from this point to that point, and this you know a starting point and a destination, and I'm going to take a certain route. Um, show me interesting events that have occurred along that route, say within maybe five kilometers of it right. uh, over the past 30 days, uh, for example, or um, I need to optimize and find the shortest route connecting all these different destinations. You know, it's like the traveling salesman problem because I have, you know, delivery people who are going to start out uh, in the morning, you know, at whatever, eight, and finish at six, and they need to hit all these different places, and we want to find the most efficient way to, to route them. Right. Uh, I mean, a couple of examples. But obviously, finding pubs is really important. Um, you know, if I, you know, I'm a tourist and I'm in a certain area, where am I? And then I want to know where are things that I'd be interested in relative to my location. Uh, yeah, and I think one of the things here too, Michael, is like spatial data. I think we always think about like maps. Like, I think that's the easiest way to think about this, right? But it's not just like lat long, right? I mean, there's, there is a bunch of other things, right? Like, I think if somebody was talking about inventory, that could be shelves and rows, right? Like there's lots of different things, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think like if I go to, um, to Lowe's to shop for some home improvement stuff, the store is enormous <laughs> and I don't know the layout, but if you, you know, project, you know, you've got this X, Y, you know, this, this plane and, you know, you know where I am. And, and so really it's just, in that case, you'd just be using the um, geometry types rather than ge geography because you're, you're just dealing with a flat surface. But, you know, ideally it would be neat for me to almost have like a shopping list. And when I, when I go to the store, it, it just shows me the most efficient path through the store to get what I want. Obviously, I can't do that now because, uh, you know, I don't shop that much these days. Right. But I think that's a great, uh, a great application. Yeah, we're just we're just starting to scratch the surface on all the different ways in which we can use some of these things. I think it's going to get more and more interesting over time. So. Oh yeah. Um. So I'm going to ask you this, Michael, and I'm, I'm going to say it's probably going to come back to the docs, but. Since you're using Hilbert curves for indexing, is there a limit to the dimension? Can I have lat, long, altitude, and time as indexed? So I guess are there limits with with our implementation for indexing? Um, so altitude or the like the z coordinate uh, yeah. z, we are we we don't have that now, but we are um, I think we've started to work on that. Um, time is another dimension that that's handled in a totally separate column. Um, and I think in this. I don't know if I have a time column in this one, in this table, but I think I do in my OSM table. Uh, so that's just a separate uh, feature that would be indexed separately. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that one. I, I can't that. talk, let me see. Uh, uh, so do I have a yeah, date, date time? time. Yeah, so right there. So that's just a separate column that, that isn't indexed here, but you certainly could. I mean, you know, CockroachDB is an OLTP database that loves to use indexes. So um, you can index that. And, yeah, and we've done a lot of work to make sure those work well across yeah. distributed environments. So, and, and you can see here that the spatial index, just since I'm here, it's considered to be a, an inverted index type. Yeah. Cool. Well, Michael, I, I, we've hit a lot of the questions. Um, I think there's there's a couple more, but I will. I you know, actually, you know, somebody's talking about if we have a multi-tenant cluster, which actually we have single cluster, single tenant cluster. We we don't have multi-tenant for customers yet, right? I think we're working on that now, correct? Uh, yeah, we are. I mean, through our cockroach cloud efforts, I mean, multi-tenancy is definitely a big focus of that. So uh, we aren't there yet, so you can't really do multi-tenant clusters right now, but. I think, yeah, if you're having a cluster that's running spatial data and other data, uh, depends on your implementation and how heavy that workload is uh, in terms of how you want to segment these things out. But, you know, we, we hope it all works in one cluster, right? So 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think with you know our ability to scale out horizontally and also to pin data, um, you know, between the, the two of those features, you can accommodate uh, yeah. mixed workloads. And I think it's one of these things too. And you know, there were several questions about performance. And you know, one of the like highlights at Cockroach is this is a scalable database. If you need more performance, simply add more nodes, and it takes care of all of the rest. Like it's spin up a node, point it at the cluster, and it's going to take care of that. And because we've actually reworked the, the, the execution layer for, for, for all this spatial work, um, that load's also going to be distributed across all those nodes, right, Michael? I mean, and that's like, that's one of the key benefits. It's not like you're working the spatial in a, in, in, in a stove pipe in a cluster. Yeah. It's not like that. Like, it doesn't, you got to divorce yourself from those concepts when you get into a distributed database, because we're talking about distributed execution as well as distribution of data, right? I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah, and, and you could also use our ability to tie data on a row by row basis to a, a geo and tie right. your spatial data to the geo it belongs to if you wanted to. I mean, right, right. So we could have a, we could have spatial data that lives in London and only live on London servers. If we wanted to. If we sure. wanted to. And I think that's what's cool about Cockroach. It's such a unique feature, the geo partitioning feature. And again, I think that's what helps us deal with latency. It helps us deal with, you know, the residency of data, where it lives, all these, you know, those types of things. So Absolutely. well, buddy. Um, listen, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. I I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't know about you, but it's <laughs> this week, you know. Well, thank everyone who who joined us. I think they're uh, yeah. great questions. Yeah, really, really good question. So, and and just super, super engaged. That we, we're like I said before, we love it when there's lots of chat and lots of uh, lots of lots of QA. You know, we want to make these things as valuable as possible. Uh, JP was monitoring questions. I'm sure we'll get water bottles out to several people today for sure. Because gosh, there were a lot of good questions, right, Jim? Or I'm mean, not Jim, Michael. Jim Hatcher also answered a bunch, I think. So I know he did. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for all your hard work in the background, buddy. It's awesome. So you're very welcome. Um, so, <laughs> hey, was, the, was that the voice of God, the voice of Jim? Jim I too, will, I like to call him, so. We'll answer all your questions now. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, everybody, thank you for taking the time you did today. I know it's a, it's a lot to, you know, carve out an hour, um, but I hope this was valuable to everybody. Go out and use Cockroach, Cockroach DB, use Core, all these capabilities here. Go start a Cockroach DB, uh, a Cockroach Cloud cluster, um, look for, uh, a free version of that uh, coming out at the end of this month in beta. Uh, we, we're excited about that. Uh, and so, but you'll be able to use all of this uh, in there uh, today. And so, um, uh, Michael, thank you so much for, um, for for all this hard work getting the app together and, and answering all these great questions. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. And then Jim, thanks uh, thanks for your help on the back end um, answering all the all the chat and QA. But thanks to everybody. Uh, please do take the survey. Um, again, we just want to get better and better in these. Uh, we, we get some really good feedback. So um, thanks to everybody. If there wasn't a question that was asked, uh, if you're looking for a demo, whatever, just reach out to us. Info at cockroachlabs.com is and it really easy to do so. Sales, of course, at Cockroach Labs email. Uh, but, but, our, but our public Slack channel is, is really the best way to engage with us. We're on there all the time, our community Slack channel. So uh, we, we would love for people to, to enjoy uh, and engage in the conversation there too. So. With that, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and everybody have a great day. See ya.